Good evening. Welcome to an evening with Kay Bailey Hutchison. The program tonight is co-sponsored by the Texas Tribune and the OBJ Library. The moderator tonight will be uh, Evan Smith, who is the editor-in-chief of the Texas Tribune and CEO of the Texas Tribune. A lot of us knew him for many years in his position with Texas Monthly, where he served for 18 years, uh, the last eight of which <clears throat> were as editor-in-chief, and the magazine won every kind of award it could win during that period of time. In introducing uh, Senator Hutchison tonight, I don't propose to uh, give you a biography. Rather, I think what I want to do is to tell you about what she's done, what she's accomplished as the United States Senator for Texas. I don't think there's any job description of what a U.S. Senator is supposed to be or supposed to do. But my own view is that the United States Senator is the primary spokesperson for the state that they represent. The Senator is the primary advocate for the state they represent. And if I'm right about that uh, role, Katie Bailey Hutchison has fulfilled that role as well as any Senator ever in the history of this state. And She's done a whole lot more than just be the advocate for the uh, state of Texas. Uh, she's also been one of the great legislators, and I'll tell you about that in just a minute. But not everything she's done required legislation. A lot of it simply required leadership, and leadership she's given. Let me tell you one about the legislation. A few years ago, uh, she realized that everybody in this country could set up an individual retirement account, an IRA, except homemakers. And it didn't make any difference if the individual, the male or female, had outside income that would qualify for a retirement account if he or she was a stay-at-home spouse, parent, individual. They didn't qualify for an IRA. She thought it was wrong and she did something about it. And today there is the homemaker IRA. I call it the K. Bailey Hutchison homemaker IRA. And if nobody else calls it that, you ought to. <laughs> but let me tell you a few things about her advocacy for the state of Texas. Advocacy that required leadership and not legislation. And there are examples all over the state, but I'm gonna pick just a handful. We have NASA in the city of Houston, thanks to Lyndon Johnson. He got it there, and Houston became the space city of the United States. But NASA is still there because of Kay Bailey Hutchison. Because a few years ago, when they were consolidating the space program and wanting to move some of the provisions of the state space program, uh, NASA, was going to be moved, was going to be changed. But Kay said, no, that didn't take legislation. That took leadership. That took some insight. That took some foresight. That took some effort. And today, Houston is still the space capital of the world, thanks to Kay Bailey Hutchison. We all know of the importance of the military bases in this state. And a few years ago, the Department of Defense correctly, wisely, decided that we ought to have some consolidations of the uh, various military bases, the elimination of some bases. So Kay got involved, got involved very actively and uh, intensively, and said, well, if there are some bases in Texas, they serve a valuable role, and if they need to have an extension of the role they serve, there needs to be a realignment of their mission, let's get the realignment of the mission. And so today, Fort Bliss, which might have disappeared from El Paso, is still in El Paso. Fort Hood, which might have uh, left Colleen, is still in Colleen. Uh, the three bases in San Antonio are still there. And we all owe a debt of gratitude to Kay Bailey Hutchison because they wouldn't be there or they wouldn't be there in those kinds of positions had it not been for Kay Bailey Hutchison. And then I think we all know that the way man and woman can affect and impact the future 
is through research. And Kay has left her mark on the research in this state. When she became United States Senator, she learned that uh, the colleges and universities in the state of Texas were a collective sixth highest of all the states in research dollars that went to those universities. We had the brain power, we had the competence and the ability and the talent to win those uh, peer-reviewed, uh, objective uh, grants that are given out, but some way, somehow, the grants were going somewhere else. The research was going to go to other parts of the country. So Kay got together the presidents of the major universities and said, look, let's do this collaboratively. Let's do this together. And the result is that we put uh, the brain power of the scientists in this state all together, and they're working together, and today, Texas has the third most grants. Again, that didn't take legislation. The legislation created the funds for the research uh, on the uh, peer review basis, but that leadership got Texas its role, its rightful role, in that arena. And then lastly, I want to tell you about an organization that I dare say that they're not more than a handful of people in this room ever heard of. Uh, it is the Academy of Medicine, Engineering, and Science of Texas, TAMIST. Have you ever heard of it? I bet you haven't. I'll tell you what it is. It is a collaborative effort of scientists, of academics, and corporate leaders of this state to get together to uh, have research done on a uh, collaborative basis. And we have in there every Nobel laureate in this state is a member of TAMIS. Uh, every uh, person that is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Science, and the Institute of Medicine, the National Academies, the best of the best, are all a part of that. Do you know how that institution got created? Kay Bailey Hutchison. And so Kay has put her imprint on so many things that people don't always realize, and she doesn't toot her horn about it, but I think we need to toot her horn about it. And so I say to you tonight that Kay Bailey Hutchison has long since left the indelible marks of her footprints on the landscape of her time, and she's left her fingerprints on the future. Linda Johnson would have been enormously proud of her as a United States Senator. Linda Johnson would be proud of her being here in this auditorium that bears his name tonight I am proud of it, proud of her being here. Please welcome Evan Smith and Senator Kay Bailey Hutchins. That was so nice, my gosh. Thank you so much. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Thank you. Senator, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Larry, thank you. It's an honor to be back here at the LBJ Library and to be partnering with you again. We're so glad that Texas Instruments kindly uh, helped to present and sponsor this event. On behalf of everybody at the Texas Tribune, I want to say to everybody in the audience how pleased we are to be here with you and, of course, what a pleasure it is to be on stage tonight with the senior United States Senator from Texas, Kay Bailey Hutchison, who was first elected to public office 40 years ago next month. A native of Galveston, a graduate of, <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, you really had to do I that. I had to huh? start off with that, didn't I? <laughs> a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin and UT School of Law, Catherine Ann Bailey had worked as the legal and political correspondent for a Houston television station just before she successfully ran for the District 90 seat in the Texas House of Representatives in November of 1972. When she arrived in Austin the following January to take her place in the 63rd legislature, she settled into minority status in two respects. As a woman, she was one of only five in the House at the time, and as a Republican. For those of you too young to remember, there used to be these people called Democrats. <laughs> she served in the Texas House for four years, became vice chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board, unsuccessfully ran for Congress, went into the banking business, and then successfully mounted a campaign for state treasurer in 1990. Three years later, she ran in a field of 24 candidates to succeed Lloyd Benson in the U.S. Senate. 
She finished first, barely, and in the runoff defeated the second place finisher, Democrat Bob Kruger, by more than two to one. The first woman to represent Texas in the upper chamber of Congress, Congress won a full term the next year and was reelected twice. She leaves the Senate this January, having served for nearly two decades, longer than LBJ, longer than Ralph Yarborough, longer than Phil Graham, and nearly as long as Lloyd Benson and John Tower. Again, please join me in welcoming an accomplished and committed public servant, someone who's given her life to Texas and to whom Texas owes great thanks, the Honorable Kay Bailey Hutchison. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Are you sure you want to go? <laughs> Reminds me of the country western song. How can I miss you if you won't, won't go, go away? away. <laughs> well, um, you have a chance to take it back here, Senator. Would no. you? Are you done? I'm ready. Really? I'm why, why are you so ready to ready. go? I can't wait to um, have another challenge to do interesting things, but on my own time yep. and uh, control my schedule and not have uh, the leaders say on Thursday afternoon after I've told my daughter that I'm going to be home tonight, uh, we have votes on Friday. You right. know, it just, uh, or have the Chamber of Commerce annual banquet that you've agreed to on Friday because you never have Friday votes and then all of a sudden you do. Uh, those kinds of things just are so stressful. I can't wait to control my schedule. Right. And as long as I'm doing interesting things with interesting people and um, doing some good, uh, which I hope I will, yep. um, then I'm really ready for the next stage. I don't doubt that control is something you'd like to have back, and I know you'll enjoy it the minute you have it back, but I'm also wondering about whether the way things have changed have, have driven your decision to leave now. I was um, saddened, as I know you were, by the passing of Arlen Specter yesterday. Uh, in some ways, I wondered if Senator Specter, who you tweeted about yesterday, you called him a tough and independent uh, a, a fighter on behalf of Pennsylvania and the country, if his independence is itself uh, fading, the notion of independence in, mm -hmm. in the Senate and in Congress is fading, and if Senator Specter's passing is kind of like the passing of an era. Politics is toxic these days, isn't it? It is toxic. There's no question Different about from it. when you first got there. Oh, definitely different from yeah. when I was first there. And I don't think I would be as effective for six more years as I have been in my 19 years. Um, I want to be effective. Right. I think I have been. Uh, but the atmosphere today is more, well, it's obviously very hardcore divided. And it's uh, there's a lot of my way or the highway mentality on right. both sides. Right. Um, I'm not a my way or the highway politician. Yeah. And so this that means it's time for me to go. And yeah. this is the right time. So you're not opposed to working, for instance, Senator, with Democrats when war circumstances warrant. You're willing to work with the other side. You know, the way I have always uh, operated is that I believe firmly in my views and the views of the Republican right. Party. I am a small government, low tax, mm -hmm. regulation that fits but not over-regulation kind of person. Um, but when the election is held, you have either two or four or six years to work with the people who were elected. Yep. And I didn't maybe choose these people, but their constituents did. Right. And my job is to work with them to make progress for our country. And that's the way I've always operated. That's not, I mean, I've known uh, people to say, well, I'd rather have a Democrat than a Republican that doesn't agree with me all the time. Not me. No. You're, 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 this notion of Republicans in name only, this phrase, yeah, rhino. rhino, that you hear yeah. about. You've actually read recently, you say, you know, look, they're just Republicans. Mm -hmm. If you're, you're a Republican, you're a Republican. That's and right. I want to work with you regardless of whether you're to my left or to my right. Right. And I have to tell you that the Democrats are the same way. It's very hard for the Democrats to veer away from the leadership message of the day. Right. And it's hard for Republicans as well. I mean, you just have this kind of uh, my way or the highway mentality that is um, gaining traction. Yeah. And I don't think we're going to see the progress that people want to see with 
so many in that mode right now. When you got to the Senate in 1993, Senator, what did you go to accomplish? Why did you want to run? Surely it just wasn't just to be Senator. You wanted to accomplish something. Right. And uh, I really believe that we had um, too much to high taxes, yeah. uh, that our economy was not working the way I wanted it to work. Um, I felt like having uh, more conservatives in the Senate would be better for us. When I ran, the majority were Democrats. Yeah. It's gone back and forth in the 19 years. Um, but I do believe in the basic philosophy that we should have a country that opens opportunities in um, in bringing people up uh, to have the same opportunities with a good education system, uh, but to celebrate success and to celebrate entrepreneurship and celebrate people who take risk and, and do well with it. Uh, that's what built our country. And I felt like we had gone away from that with a big bloated government and spending and uh, just a constant dependence on more government. No. And um, so that, that was why I ran. Of course, two decades later, Senator, those same battles seem to be mm -hmm. waged today. We're still fighting over spending, over the size and purpose and you know, use of government. We seem to still be fighting about whether government is getting out of the way and giving people the adequate opportunity to be entrepreneurial and to mm -hmm. control their own life. So why in these last 20 years has it been so hard to move the needle, in your opinion? Well, I think if you look at the history of the United States, it would still have been the same major issues when they were writing the Constitution. I, I yeah. think it's always going to be that pull yeah. between people who want more government and more spending and uh, more uh, programs versus the sort of basics of we need the small federal government, which our founders did intend, yeah. and to leave most of it to the states. Um, and I think that's been the struggle that our country has had since its founding. Do you, uh, do you leave the Senate in January considering your tenure to be a total success? Are there things that you regret that you were not able to get accomplished? Oh, sure. I mean, you never feel... Let me ask you to talk about that. In a legislative body, you never feel a total success. Yeah. Uh, I think I've been successful in the main things. Um, I, I feel like I have made an imprint on our military and yeah. uh, making sure that we were ready and uh, that we were uh, building up our bases in America where we have training and support and deployment uh, on our own. Um, I feel that I've had... Uh, a major impact on taxes and my homemaker IRA uh, that allows women who work out inside the home to have the same retirement opportunities as those who work outside the home. Yep. Uh, the marriage penalty relief. Uh, I've had a lot of impact, but on the other hand, have I done everything I wanted to do? No, yeah. I haven't. I, um, you know, maybe I made some mistakes. Maybe I uh, didn't get Social Security reform. I think entitlement reform is essential. I've introduced legislation right. for Social Security reform. Uh, I couldn't even get more than two co-sponsors for that bill, uh, even though I reached out to Democrats because I wanted to really pass it. Um, so I think um, you don't win everything you want when yeah. you're one of 100, right. but you definitely want to achieve big things big things and also uh, little things. Little, little things are very important when you're um, representing a state as big as Texas. Well, let, let's, let's go there. Let's go to Texas uh, uh, first then in terms of talking about the things that you were able to accomplish and the things you're proud of. You've really worked very, very hard to, to bring things home to Texas. At a time when the national conversation has turned a little negative on earmarks, that's mm -hmm. the nice way to say it. Pork mm -hmm. is the way that Mm -hmm. is, uh, it is said pejoratively. Would you talk about your view of, uh, of your responsibility to Texas, the work that you've done, and why you think, despite what the national conversation may say about mm -hmm. this stuff, that you believe this is part of your job? Well, first of all, I have done big national things. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's important for a senator. Right. I wouldn't want to just be myopic. But I also will tell you that big states are at a disadvantage in the Senate. You've got to have someone willing to fight for your constituents, or they're going to 
be left behind. At a disadvantage, how come? Why, why would you say that? Well, because um, Delaware and, New, and Rhode Island and New Hampshire have the same number of votes as Texas. Right. And the little states outnumber the big states for sure. And when it comes to formulas and highway funding, um, we have to fight hard to stay up. And that's one of the things I've done, is try to get our highway funding up. And we're at 100% now. Uh, but we were 78 cents when I got to the Senate uh, because you get nibbled to death by ducks. <laughs> and um, that's just the nature of it. Yeah. So you do have to fight hard uh, to make sure that you get your fair share of um, things that are being done, whether it's a formula or the appropriations. One of the things that Larry so kindly mentioned was Tamist. Well, when I went on the Appropriations Committee, I found that a lot of money was going for academic research, and Texas was sixth in academic research dollars from the federal government. And I thought, now wait a minute. I understand California's first, they are much bigger. I understood maybe New York would be second, but I could not understand Texas being, being third. Six. I mean, sixth, because we have great research institutions. Right. It wasn't like I went in and said, well, it should be Texas because we're third in the nation and, and at that time in population, now we're second. But I said, wait a minute, we have MD Anderson, we have UT Southwestern, we have University of Texas at Austin with Nobel laureates and scientific uh, uh, research that is making a difference. Why aren't we in this game? And so I went about having summits for five years with yep. our chancellors and presidents coming to Washington to learn what the priorities of the federal government research uh, was. And I urged collaboration. We formed an organization, a, an academy, with all of our Nobel laureates and National Academy members. And we started collaborating. And we built our research um, with this effort. We went from six to third. Yep. We get a billion dollars a year based on merit, based on our uh, systems and our centers of excellence coming together and putting together better packages that were accepted and peer reviewed. Yep. Um, so I wasn't you know, earmarking because it was Texas, but I was making sure that we got in the right way. Right. In fact, I've never earmarked for a private company. Yeah. I've There's a difference between private earmarks and, then, oh, and, yeah. and public funds. Absolutely, yeah. and everything that I've done has been for national priorities that are in Texas, that are academic institutions or right. cities or counties or the state, yep. and making sure that we get what our fair share is. And, and let me just speak for one moment about the budget and the way we should be budgeting. Yeah. I am for setting a top line of the budget and making sure that that top line is in line with um, an overall economic uh, excellence, really. And our overall spending has been about 20% of gross domestic product for the last 40 years. Today, however, it's 24%, and entitlements are 60%, and we're out of whack. Yep. So I'd set it at 18. I'd set it at 18% now, getting those deficits down. But once your 18 is set, I want to make sure that we don't get shortchanged, that our priorities right. are right, and that NASA doesn't get shortchanged, that our research institutions right. are having the ability to continue the great entrepreneurial research that is making our economy more efficient and the technology that is making our communications more efficient. Uh, those are the things that I think we ought to be doing with a vision, a budgetary top line, right. but then making sure that we're spending the money in the right way. So why is the conversation national? What you say, it, it all sounds very reasonable, it sounds appropriate, but you know that the national conversation is turned yeah. against mm -hmm. the idea of bringing stuff home. In fact, a number of people, Rand Paul, your colleague from Kentucky, and others, ran in the last cycle expressly opposed to the idea of mm -hmm. many of the kinds of projects you've talked about. I agree, and I think that is what is 
in vogue right now because yep. I think people are scared to death. They see a $16 trillion debt, right. and they see a trillion dollars in deficits every year. Yep. And it, people are saying, we've just got to stop it all. Right. We've got to stop it all. I don't think we need to stop it all, but, but a reasoned um, argument is right. not being heard right now because people are rightly very afraid of our economic house turning right. over. Well, let me ask the question, Senator, from the other side. You know, here in Texas, we seem to have a real hostility to money from the federal government. In fact, we seem to have a hostility to the federal government, period. Um, are you uh, are, are comfortable making the argument that maybe we've gotten a little bit over our skis as far as our hostility to Washington? Because there are a lot of areas of public life, whether it's education or the environment or health care, just to name three, where there's a lot of tension between Texas and the federal government. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you feel like that level of tension is properly calibrated. I don't. I think um, I, I agree in many ways with the anti-federal overreach. Yep. Um, I do. But I think the hostility has hurt, in some cases, my ability to get things done or to be able to affect. Um, and I think we could calibrate it better and get what we want and what fits Texas, yep. uh, while also saying no sometimes. And I think in some, sometimes the right answer is no. Yeah. So for instance, in the question of health care, right now there's a conversation going on about the opportunity to expand Medicaid, Medicaid. Mm -hmm. bring more federal dollars to Texas, a state, as you know, with 5.8 million uninsured people, 23% of the population were first among the 50 states in the percentage of our population uninsured. The governor and other people in the administration here in Austin are resistant to the idea of taking additional federal money. They say, nope, we don't want to expand federal Medicaid. Is that the kind of thing where you think maybe Texas is, is not regarding that opportunity properly? You know, I would look at the numbers yeah. because the federal government uh, in the Obamacare says they'll pay for three years 100%, then it goes to 90%, right. but you've got more people that are going to have to be picked up. Right. And I would really look at what the dollars would be that the federal government would be putting in, what the state would have to put in, and if it could be done more efficiently. Yeah. One of the things that, that I know um, that... I would look at, and I think the state has looked at, is could you get the money in a block grant with flexibility, say, and go to a Blue Cross or another health insurance company and say, we will give you the Medicaid dollars for this family of four if you will take our, our Texas amount and then you will give the insurance for that family. Yep. Um, and can you do it better that way and give better service uh, to the people in their health care, right. but also do it in a more efficient way? I think it's right to question. I do. Um, and I don't know what the answer is because I haven't looked at the details of right. how long we would, I mean, how much we would have to do in federal regulations and coverage and expansion versus what you could do with the money as well. Yeah, but at a minimum, flexibility would need to be a, a, part, oh, of, a part of any conversation. Definitely. You, you referenced, uh, Senator, the Social Security reform that you had hoped to do previously, not successful, but you tried. Mm -hmm. Obviously, entitlement reform is a major topic right now in the presidential campaign. It's a major mm -hmm. topic in Washington. We're very concerned about the cost of Medicare. What are we going to do about Social Security? Could, could you offer a little guidance? You're liberated now from having to run for re-election. You don't have to raise any more money. So just among the hundreds of us in this room, just tell us the truth. What should we be actually be doing on entitlement reform if you had your, mm -hmm. if you had your wish? Well, just as an example, we, we have to bring entitlements down to an amount that can be covered with our gross domestic product. If you kill your, your industry, your... Uh, people who are able to give jobs, yeah. uh, the, gold, the goose that lays the golden egg, um, then no one is going to have the kind of care that we, we want to give. So I think you have to look at these entitlements, including Medicare and Social Security. I think Social Security is fairly easy. 
Uh, my plan would have left people who were 55 years old today and above alone. But if you were under 55, if you're 54, you would have retired full retirement, not at 66, but at 66 years and three months. Right. If you're 53, it would have been 66 years and six months. So gradually so raise the three eligibility. Three months yeah. a year, yeah. you would raise it uh, to a maximum of 68, or you could go to 69, yeah. uh, more in line with the actuarial tables when Social Security was passed. Which have changed dramatically, oh. right? Life expectancy is significantly greater. Oh, people greater are working, today. they want right. to work. Um, so I think that you could do that, and then if you lowered the cost of living increase, not eliminate it, right. but if it gets a, if the cost of living goes above one percent, then you would uh, kick in a cost of living increase. But at one percent, it's not that much, and you would not start until one percent. Right. Do those two things, and Social Security is sound for 75 years, yeah. and the deficit goes down by $4 trillion. Why couldn't you get a co-sponsor on the Democratic side, or for that matter, 99 co-sponsors across the parties for a plan like that? Well, I asked the same question. Yeah. Don't know why. Is it because you, Social Security, as Pat Moynihan famously said, is the third rail of politics? Is well, that what it is? I think that if we had leadership, on both sides of the aisle, and the president. The president did nothing on Social Security So you, you attempted to do Social Security reform in this administration? Yes. Was Governor Bush or President, we know him as Governor Bush a little bit, pardon me, uh -huh. was President Bush any better on Social Security reform than the President well, Obama's he, been? He did try to do a privatization that would give people a choice. Right. How would that have worked out, given the way the economy's gone the last couple of years? Well, actually, it would have been hard during these times, yeah. but you would have had choices that wouldn't have involved um, wouldn't have involved stock uh, um, equity um, tranches, and you could have chosen what you wanted to do. Right. You could have even had government bonds, but um, in the end, it would have been much more sound. Preferable I mean, to what we have know, right now. Yeah, and you yeah. know that there have been a few counties in Texas right. that have actually Galveston been on Galveston County, yeah, for instance. Galveston County. Right. It's a, it's a privatized system where you could make a choice, and, and it's working fine. Of course, people are concerned that if you give money over to people and they invest it and they lose it, then they're just totally out of it. Yeah, but you wouldn't do that. You yeah. would have uh, very set right. requirements for the kinds of funds that right. you could could go into, right. uh, and they would have to be balanced, and you wouldn't allow uh, people to just go in and um, make investments that would be clearly risky. Well, one thing I didn't hear you mention, Senator, and I want to ask you about this in terms of Social Security but also Medicare, is means testing. Mm -hmm. People who hit a certain income threshold may not be as desperately in need of those funds as people with lower incomes, and so maybe one way to lower the amount of obligation that the federal government has is to means test for those kinds of entitlement programs. What about, what about that? Well, I don't like means testing, especially for Social Security, yeah. because I think people should never, when they've earned something, saved it, it's not, an, it's not a welfare program. Yeah. It's something that they have worked for and earned. It's theirs. Yes. Now, you could do something on the edges that say you would never lose what you put in. You right. would have a certain amount that would be required, but you could do less in, say, the cost of living increases. Yeah. And that wouldn't hurt the people that have invested, right. but yet would bring down the cost. So you could do something on the edges like that. Right. Uh, on Medicare, that one is uh, harder because it is something that has just grown, right? Um, and the cost of healthcare has grown so much that right. it's not feasible uh, with the system that we have now. Got to do something. But you, you yeah. do have to do something, and I think it has to be giving people more of a choice. The one size fits all program, which is one of the big problems with Obamacare, um, I think is never going to work. I think it's right. going to to sink from its own weight. Because, you know, some people would rather have uh, a big deductible right. and pay less month to month. Some people would rather have a small deductible and pay more month to month. Yeah. Some people need OB-GYN. Some people need um, 
um, you know, elderly care. So you, you need to be able to choose what fits your budget and your needs and what you want to do. Or maybe you want to um, have the ability to go to a boutique uh, doctor right. and pay a certain amount and not be in the Medicare system. So, but it, it is important that whatever we do in Medicare and Medicaid, uh, that the reimbursements to the healthcare community be enough that they will take the patients and give them the good care. So one criticism of the President's Affordable Care Act is that in the cuts he's made to the program, mm -hmm. he's reducing payments to providers and that that puts the system and in some risk. And then that's going to make a second class tier. The, the, the plan mm -hmm. that Governor Romney is advocating in opposition to the Affordable Care Act is largely, it's called premium support in quotes, which is basically a voucher. It takes, mm -hmm. it's so a voucher. you turn money back over to people. The Kaiser Foundation put out a study today that said that in fact the cost to seniors under that plan would actually go up quite dramatically. This doesn't concern you? that if we give more control over that the result might be costs go up for individual seniors? I don't know what they base that on. So right. I guess I can't comment because I think that is uh, an idea that has merit yeah. to let people have a certain amount and yeah. then if they want to go beyond that, they can. Yeah. Uh, but it would be an amount, but you wouldn't shortchange the healthcare community in the process because you want people to have a choice that gives them good care and quality care. I'm interested, Senator, because tonight is kind of a valedictory. It's a celebration of all your years. I want to touch on the legacy pieces. And you mentioned, uh, Larry mentioned Tamist, and you mentioned the importance of research. Higher ed generally has been something, as I've known you over the years a little bit through Texas Monthly and now the Tribune, you've talked about higher ed almost every time we've been together mm -hmm. as something that you consider to be so important. I know that we are sitting on the campus of your alma mater today. But I want you to talk a little bit more expansively than just UT about why you think higher ed is so important. And what is the appropriate role of the federal government and what's the appropriate role of the state government in making those opportunities available? You may have heard that over the last year we've had kind of an interesting discussion about higher ed reform. Kind of. So you've heard a little bit about that. So yeah. I wonder if I can ask you to talk a little bit about the importance of higher ed as one of the things you've thought about for so long. Well, first of all, for Texas, I want our state to be known and respected as a high quality academic um, higher education providing state. Yep. I think the number <clears throat> of major companies that move here, they want an educated workforce. They want the research capabilities to do public private partnerships and have great research, and then they want their students who come out to have been around great research and great programs. We will not be a state that is respected in America and the world if we're not a high quality, academic, excellent institution. Are we there which now? In, which includes yeah. great research and attracting the best professors, which attract then the best students and yeah. give them the best opportunities uh, to learn in, in a way that will make them productive yeah. citizens when they're hired. And we have great tier ones. We have three, we should have six. Yeah. And we should know which ones can be the six and we need to put the money there and prioritize it. So why, why haven't we so far, Senator? Well, I. I think that any talk of devaluing research is not productive. Yeah. And it is hurting our image and we need to we need to say look, I'm not against experimenting with um, four year $10,000 degrees, but you don't do it with your flagships. Texas and A&M and Rice of course, but Rice is private, but um, they are good, solid, big-time academic institutions that are highly rated in the country. And that is a draw. It's a draw for business. It's a draw for research uh, sharing and collaboration. And we need to have three more, and we need to put the money into three more. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have six that are on the cusp. I would um, I'd make those decisions based on who has the capability to uh, get to that uh, tier one status? I mean. Do you have a point of view about which three? <laughs> well, I think there, it has to be judged on factors. Yeah. And it, it includes a lot of factors. 
uh, to be in that tier one. I think you are seeing the ones that are emerging. Yep. Uh, but you know, California has nine. Right. Uh, New York has seven, and we've got three. Yeah. I mean, that's not this, enough. This, this bothers you. I've, oh, I've heard you say this before. And we right. we need to have three more, and we need to put the money into three more. And frankly, there are other opportunities for centers of excellence in the ones who wouldn't be in that six to do better than the six in certain right. fields. Right. You know, I always give the example. I don't want to offend anyone here, but what do you know about the University of Missouri? Well, they have the, maybe the number one journalism department in America. What else do you know well, number, about? Maybe number two. <laughs> what else do you know about Missouri? Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. So that means they have got a center of excellence, and we can argue about one and two, but they've got a center of excellence that they have they put together, and they've made it the best in America. Right. We can do that with non-tier one institutions. Right. If we focus and we spend our money in a very focused and wise and productive way. Hard to argue with any, anything you say, Senator, but of course, you know, these are austere times. Mm -hmm. State share of higher ed funding is down and it's continuing to go down. Nobody expects, even in, if times return to, to, uh, to level or even a little bit better than they are right now, that we're gonna suddenly return a whole lot of funding to higher ed. There are competing priorities. What do you do in a state like Texas where you've got such competing Good priorities. People want pu great public ed and higher ed and health care. We have a water plan that we need to fund. We have all these ambitious things for Texas. Don't have very much money, and there seems right now to be not much of a stomach for new revenue sources. Well, what, do we, what do we do? Well, for one thing, I'd prioritize the spending. For instance, we have um, the Enterprise Fund that we use to lure businesses here. We do. And, and I'm sure that has been effective in many ways, but I would... I'd put that money, the hundreds of millions of dollars, into education and higher education and prioritizing. Yep. Because we have such a good business environment. Low taxes, reasonable uh, regulation. Predictable not regulation. Over, right, yeah, yeah, predictable, solid regulation. Uh, tort reform that's good. We are a pro-business state. Yep. And I think we would attract the business that is coming here for all of the advantages we have I, I wouldn't be giving incentives, and I think the incentives also mean that you are favoring a new business over one that has been here for 30 or 40 or 50 years and has contributed to the economy. I wouldn't pick winners and losers. I would put the money into higher education and research and the things, or, or maybe even K through 12 in certain right. instances. But I would put it in places where we could build our infrastructure, where we're not maybe looking at the future, and I wouldn't be putting it into picking winners and losers. That, right. That's one thing. Let me ask you about another legacy piece related to your gender. Uh, uh, when you got into the Texas House, as we said, there were five women. Uh, obviously, there are more than five women in the Texas legislature, in the House and the oh, yeah. Senate now. And, you know, you're, there are many more women who are United States senators today. In fact, I believe there are more today than there have been before, and they're mm -hmm. fixing to be perhaps, 17. Mm -hmm. perhaps to, be, to be more. Um, uh, how has gen your gender and your status, relative minority status, in the Texas legislature and in Congress affected your view of why you're there? Do you see yourself as a, a woman senator or as a senator who happens to be a woman? Well, definitely a senator who happens to be a woman. I don't want people to think of me as the woman senator from right. Texas. Um, however, I do think that the importance of electing women yeah. is that you have all of the experiences that are necessary to make good law and good policy. Right. So I have focused on some things that, in my experience, were lacking. Homemaker IRAs. Why would we give opportunities for people who work outside the home to save tax-free for their retirement, but not allow homemakers to do that when they're the ones most vulnerable in yeah. retirement security? Um, I experienced that and um, was not able to continue giving to my IRA, which I'd started as a single working woman when I got married, and I said, uh, if I ever have a chance, I'm going to change this. Right. And I did. Yeah. And it could be the marriage penalty tax. It could be health care. 
uh, when uh, you talk about um, not covering women's mammograms if they're under the age of 40, when they have breast cancer in their families? Right. Are you kidding me? And the, all the women of the Senate, boy, every seven, 17 of Regardless us. Regardless of when party, I, right. Yeah, when I got there, there were uh, nine of us, and we were 100% against allowing that. And that was one of the amendments that we put up that yeah. uh, that was when it was Clinton care before. Um, and we all voted against it, and that was done. And, and now it's back up. Uh, these are the things that we can do. Mammogram standards, um, breast cancer research, um, so many things that uh, men weren't against. They just hadn't had the experience. That's why you have diversity uh, in your legislative bodies. Yeah. And so I think it is important to have a group of women. Um, and I think it's important for us to bring our experiences to the table. Yeah. And... Um, but I, I'm, my first responsibility is to be a good senator for America Regardless and of for Texas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We heard a lot over the last six to eight months about a war on women. I think you probably heard this a couple times yourself. Uh, it often related to issues like abortion and contraception and even in the last few months since uh, Congressman Aiken was nominated to run for the Senate in Missouri, we heard a lot about rape. Would you care to comment on this notion of, of politics being hostile to women, a war on women, and where we might be all uh, thinking about these very complicated, complex, controversial issues? Well, I don't, I think that it has become a political kind of issue that is not valid. Um, the issues that affect women are the issues that we all care about. Right. The economy, national security, and um, the the issues that are being used right now are personal issues. Um, you know, mothers and daughters can disagree about uh, abortion. I mean, that's a very personal issue. Yeah. And um, so having a view about that, I don't think is a war on women. I think that is something that has become convenient to use as a political hammer. Um, so... I, I, I don't see it as a real issue. I think we do come together for Americans mm. and um, in in the Senate, and women are represented, and we stand up. And uh, not one woman in the Senate voted against the Violence Against Women Act. Yeah, not one. We disagreed with parts of it, right. but in the end, what united us was uh, every one of us, Republicans, Democrats, across right. the board. And um, you know, I've I've worked very hard for certain women's issues, Amber Alerts for abduct, right. uh, abducted children, and um, um, stalking legislation to protect women. Right. Uh, I I had a stalker for probably 15 years. I knew what it was like, and I knew that there should be a way to. I mean, basically, you couldn't prosecute someone. Um, before we passed the anti-stalking laws. I did that, I do that with Amy Klobuchar from Minnesota. A Democrat, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But on some of these more controversial issues, Senator, you've always steered a somewhat more centrist course and sometimes been at odds with your own party on this. You don't feel that women in this country have anything to fear from, from where Congress is coming down on some of these issues that seem to be relitigated, things they thought were settled policy as well as, well as settled law. Well, I think that um, reason will prevail. Reason will prevail. It'd be nice if that applied across the board on everything, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, it would. Um, Senator, I've waited long enough to ask you about the 2010 governor's race. <laughs> I need to ask you about the 2010 governor's race. Um, do you have any regrets challenging Governor Perry for the Republican nomination in 2010? Well, keep in mind that I didn't challenge Governor Perry. I mean, that was the way it played out, but I... That wasn't your intention? No, not at all. Um, I deferred from running four years earlier. Right. Um, I really wanted to run then, um, but I didn't because it would have caused a lot of hard feelings and havoc. Uh, and on the um, word of the governor to supporters, not to me personally, but to my supporters who asked me not to run, right. he, he said he would not run in 2010. 
I started building a campaign probably in 2008 and was building support. On that assumption. On that assumption. And then in August of 2009, he said he was running again. Well, then I had a real catch-22 because people had committed to me. We had a campaign going. Was I going to walk away and leave people hanging or walk away from something that I really wanted to do? That was hard. That was a hard decision. Um, And I didn't want to walk away again. I felt like that was my best and last chance. And I really wanted to be governor. There were things that I felt were not being done. Um, The priorities were a little different. And um, so I just didn't back away. Yeah. So then it got to be, um, I thought it was a horrible race. I wish I, wish I hadn't done it Hor- uh, horrible in that way. But, Sen- Senator, um, horrible, horrible why? Horrible in what respect? Well, um, I beca- Washington and the anti-Washington feeling was put on me rather than uh, running uh, on what I wanted to do for Texas, running on what I thought wasn't being done by the governor. Um, it became a, uh, a referendum on me and Washington. Well, you know, Washington is not the most popular thing in Texas, as you have pointed out. Yeah. And, um, and my successes in representing Texas were used against me, effectively. I mean, yeah. he, he did a great job. He ran a great campaign. Do you think he treated you fairly? No. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> in a campaign... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's, that's politics. Not, oh yeah, I that's, mean, you that's know, the that's the way it goes. Do you, and do you think the governor? Uh, do you think the governor senator has has done a good job as governor and is doing a good job today? Mm. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> well, you know, I think the the people speak, um, and if I had thought he was doing everything uh, right for the future of Texas, of course. I wouldn't have run. You wouldn't have run. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, and do you, do you, let me leave the governor to the side and ask the question a little bit more gently then. Do you mm-hmm. think that the, that the state is doing well now? And are there things that the state is not doing that it ought to be doing for the future? The basics of the state are, I think, exactly right. Yeah. Um, and they were put in place years ago before either Governor Perry or myself uh, were here. And that is, we don't have a state income tax. Now, I did fight against having one. I have to say, when Bob Bullock said we ought to be looking at a state income tax, I was the sole person who stood up and said no. And I wrote op-eds against Governor Bullock uh, on that subject. Yeah. And so um, I think having no income tax, having a right-to-work state, yeah. having good tort law and low taxes, um, good regulations are the basics, and we do that well. Yeah. Are we looking to the future? Are we preparing in education, um, not only our K through 12, our community colleges, which can be such great incubators for technology training, and uh, I think are undervalued. Um, I think they can be such a contributor to our, our state in a very efficient way by sharing local Mm -hmm. uh, uh, matching funds. And I think our higher education, I mean, I would have a requirement right now that we have the mission of six tier one institutions because it's it's research magnets, it is academic excellence, it is, um, and and I would build centers of excellence. And let me give you another example on that, where, I was called by Gil Grosvenor one day about probably six or seven years ago. Gil is the uh, chairman emeritus of National Geographic. And he said, I want you to speak to the first Gil Grosvenor Center lectureship at um, Texas State University. And I said, I would love to do that. I am so honored that you would ask me, and I want to ask you, how did you choose Texas State University for your center, the Gil Grosvenor Center? And he said, I looked all over the country for, I think he said three 
Gil Grosvenor Centers where I thought the geography program was the best. Right. And Texas State University was one of the three. Yeah. And I said, that's fabulous. And what I did with my earmarks is I went to Texas State University, I did speak, but I said, you know, this is a center of excellence yeah. that I want to build on. Right. I want you to continue to be one of the three best geography programs in America, and you can be better than anybody in Texas. You've already got a start. You have Gil Grobener, you've got National Geographic, you've got, um, you've got something we can build on. And I said, don't come to me for anything but, but that. That's what I said. And, and did they come to you for that? Yes, and well, they did. I mean, they took did. Took the bait. They, they did. They didn't just come to me for that. Right. <laughs> but but, they, but right. I, that's what I wanted to build on. And I've gone to Lamar University yeah. where I, I've said, look, you, you have a unique geographic location. You're next to the second largest chemical complex in, a, in the world, actually. And you've got an engineering program. And we need to gear it toward the research and the um, pro academic programs and internships and, and have your professors um, go in with the refineries that are in your area and let's bring these kinds of technical uh, engineers forward and, and they've done that. Oh, they've been great about that. Right. And, and they've, they've built their programs and they're doing some great work there and they're putting out great engineers that are being hired by the refineries in that but This area. is the kind of stuff, Senator, that you think as a state we gotta be focused on doing. Yes, yeah. and the originality that you can do when, you're, when you have a focus right. and that, that right. takes us not to the next five years but the next 25. Yeah, we're gonna open up the questions in the audience in a second, but you sound like somebody with a vision for Texas, like maybe you might like to run for governor. For no, <laughs> I do not want to run are for you, governor. Uh, <laughs> I are, don't. Are, are you done in politics as well as in the U.S. Senate? Well, I think so. I mean, yes, I have no plans to run. I hate to always say never, because then you'd be the first one back on my doorstep. Oh, I would. And say, I would. but here's what you, you said. You on that day, yeah. but, but you but, think you're done. But I, uh, yes, I have no ambition whatsoever, except to have a great, interesting next life. You're gonna write books, you're gonna be a mom, and you're gonna come back to Dallas, at least for the short term? Oh, definitely Dallas. Well, Texas, anyway. Yeah. Um, and um, I want to, I want to have a career. I mean, I really right. want to stay in business and I want to um, be doing interesting things. I'm gonna have a um, Kay Bailey Hutchison chair in Latin American law at the law school. Here. Yes, right. and I want to do stuff with the LG, LBJ school right. uh, because we have a, a center of excellence opportunity that we should grab. UT should be the place where you come to undergraduate, LBJ school, law school, if you want to do business and trade or represent um, businesses that want to do trade with, with Central yeah. and South America. Right. This is our hemisphere. It's where we ought to be doing our trade. Right. We ought to be trading and building up the um, economies of Central and South America and Mexico uh, because strong economies are gonna make for a stronger hemisphere. Yeah. Well, Senator, it sounds like you're not done with public life at a minimum. And yeah. let me say on behalf of everybody here, we're going to be happy to have you come home. So thank you very much, Senator. Thank you. Good to see you. you. Maybe take a couple of questions. Of course, on the one hand, we covered a lot of ground. On the other hand, much more ground to be covered. And we have microphones, I believe, in the aisles that would permit you to Approach them, ask questions. We have a couple, a couple of minutes for questions before the senator needs to da dash, dash out of here. So let me, I'll go side to side and please ask good ones. Sorry. All right, uh, Senator Hutchison, uh, first off, thank you for letting me intern with you at my years okay. at Rice. Oh, yay, good. And uh, my question is, where would you draw the line between good governing and good campaigning? Well, they are generally very different characteristics. Um, and I think that um, some people love campaigning and some people love governing. Um, and sometimes you get people who love both. Um, Are you one of those? Uh, 
I, yes, I am, and I think LBJ was uh, right here. He was a great campaigner, but he also governed. Um, and I think that what, uh, what, what I would just say is that you must be willing to govern and do the study, do the research, and get in the weeds uh, to be a really great public servant. I do think the most important thing is the governing part. Um, and if you're a good politician as well, that's Lanyap. How do you feel about politicians, Senator, who campaign on one set of issues or one set of positions, and then once they get into office, change those positions? You know, this is obviously a constant discussion in politics, mm -hmm. whether it's Senator Kerry's run in 04, Governor Romney has been subject to that charge in this campaign. What do you think about that? Well, I think that we should be flexible to let people change. Oh, man, if you change your position on something, it's hard because you get jumped on by the press, you get jumped on by the people who uh, might disagree with you, but you do evolve. If, if you're thoughtful, you do evolve. Now, you have to have principles, and the core principles, I think, have to be uh, reliable. But then you have to address the issues from that core principle um, in a way that does evolve with, with time. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I think Mitt Romney, you have to give him some leeway for being governor of Massachusetts uh, versus uh, now looking at the economy as we have it and seeing this fiscal cliff and seeing maybe what worked and what didn't in healthcare reform and taking that experience and uh, evolving into what we need right now. Sir. Thank you. Um, currently, uh, on the last debate between the vice presidential candidates, um, Joe Biden made a comment that as a Catholic, he, he may be against abortion, but he also felt that he didn't want to force his way on anybody. And there's a lot of good people out there who have different opinions. Well, currently we have extremes in our country at either end, the Tea Party and, and what they call the liberals. And I was just wondering, if you think that the political system can survive with these two ends and no middle ground, or do you think that there's going to be a, a new party? There has been some disappearance of people in the middle center, to a degree, on both sides, right? Yes. I, I, I do believe that we have to have parties. Well, first of all, I believe in the two-party system. Um, and I think it is so important that people get involved in the party that's closest to them and try to work within that. Because I think we've seen in other countries where you've got three, four, five, six, seven parties, and then you don't get a working majority. And therefore, when people vote, they don't really have the ability to change the course of the country. And I think the beauty of our system has been that, by and large, Mostly, we've had a two-party system, and I hope we keep that so that you can change the direction of your state or your nation with votes that will count. So I do think that. But having said that, I think the middle people are not active in the parties, and therefore the party activists tend to be the more extremes on either end. They control the nominations, and therefore your middle is shrinking because they're so polarized. Our, the people in the middle who kind of have the reasoned approach need to be more active. They need to be more committed. They need to be more mm. um, willing to stand and fight. Um, so the people in Indiana who concern that Dick Luger was defeated by Richard Murdoch or the people in Massachusetts who consider Elizabeth Warren to be too liberal, the issue is really with the people in those states who did not vote in an adequate numbers to get other candidates in those races. Well, I think by and large, not to be specific on, on those, but by and large, um, you don't see regular people go to precinct conventions. And the precinct conventions are the people who choose the people who go to the senatorial conventions and the state conventions and right. pick the delegates to the national conventions. And people don't in the everyday workaday world, people don't think about 
gee, I really need to go to my precinct convention tonight. Um, it's the activists in who go. Order. Yeah. It's the activists who go, who know the system. And uh, we need to, if we're going to really get a more representative uh, party structure for nominations, we need for people to be active in the party system. But keep it to two. Two parties. OK. Sir. Just uh, one question about <clears throat> the Obamacare. Has anybody in the Senate or the Congress read the 2,000 pages plus uh, agreement uh, law that they're going to pass, or they did pass, rather, in a very short period of time? Nobody could possibly have read it in that short period of time. And I'm just curious, has anybody read it yet? Well, certainly. My sense is he's not a fan of the, of the piece of legislation. Yeah, well, he, you know, yeah. uh, I have to say that nobody could have read it. Um, and um, Nancy Pelosi basically said, you know, we're going to pass it, and then you'll be able to read it. Now, there have been, there's been reform now that you have uh, at least 48 hours. I, th I think that's the rule right now, uh, that a bill has to be on the Internet before it will pass the House. They have reformed. Um, and... Uh, no, but nobody read it before it was passed. Now, I have to say, I mean, I am who I am. Um, not one Republican voted for that bill in the House or the Senate. Not one. So, um, you know, I, none of us were comfortable with it. Now that it's been found constitutional, uh, Senator, do you think that there should be a move to repeal it? I do. You do? I absolutely do. You are for that? I am for it. I think yeah. we need to make health care more affordable and access for more people. But I think tearing down the system, which is what I think Obamacare will do, um, ca should not be allowed to happen. And the bad stuff starts next year in 2014. The taxes, the fines. Um, I just think business people, if you don't have the one-size-fits-all prescribed program offered to your employees, then you're going to be fined anyway. Wasn't the individual mandate originally a Republican idea, Senator? Well, it didn't pass as a Republican idea. <laughs> just, just, just be, I'm being sporting, know. I'm asking. I do, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Um, I can't say the individual mandate was, but... I know that, I, I know Obamacare is not right for our country. Ma'am. Good evening, Senator Hutchinson. My name is Erin Ferris-Smith, and I'm with the Pelchin Children's Center in Houston, Texas. We are the state's largest provider for foster care, adoption, and mental health for children and families. And you, during your tenure in office, have been absolutely wonderful with your time and resources and support for funding on those issues. There are the health and human service issues that don't get as much play as Obamacare and transportation. It's just the lesser issues, but they're just as important and have such a huge fiscal impact. I wonder if you see yourself being involved in those causes, particularly as a Republican on the prevention side, what we do for children saves them from entering the criminal justice system and they can be you know, members of society after attending education. Do you see yourself continuing your work, your work in those areas and possibly being involved in that way? Because there's such important sure. issues. Great question. Yes, it is, and definitely. Uh, I am going to want to do things for, for that cause. Um, I also, I, I want to be a, a voice for uh, women in countries that have, um, so slighted women's rights. Um, Hillary Clinton and I were the honorary chairs, are the honorary chairs of Vital Voices, and um, it, it works to bring women up in these countries because if women have the ability to get an education, they contribute so much to the economy, and it's where the economies have been more successful. So uh, human rights, children's rights, um, just doing everything that we can to, to build up um, our basic health and welfare um, of our society sh should certainly be part of uh, the volunteer efforts that I will make. Well, we look forward to working with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm being given the signal that we need to cut this off so that the senator can catch a plane. I appreciate the... Well, yeah. One thing I yes. will say is yes. 
if we could just get later flights from Austin to Dallas, I could stay right. longer. Would you please make that a, a <laughs> job number one in your retirement? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, Senator, at least we have direct flights to Washington National. Finally, now for at least Austin. one direct flight. Yes. That's right. Senator, we feel very uh, lucky to have had an opportunity to sit with you today, and I know that uh, the audience shares uh, my oh, opinion thank you that all it for is being great here. to spend time thank with you. you. Senator Kay Bailey Hudson, thank, thank you very much.